so this month the two choices made on Patreon for extended videos were History of Naval Enigma, which we've already done, or rather the breaking of it, and also Naval Boilers, which I suppose is a fairly appropriate subject for this time of year, because it's usually pretty cold outside. I mean, being in the UK, it's just very, very damp, um, but a boiler will always keep you warm, even if you're in the middle of the ocean. Now, to be clear, we're not going to be talking about a ship's engines, single expansion, double expansion, triple expansion, turbines, diesels, etc., because that's an entire subject for an entirely different video. But we are going to be talking about the boilers, the first part of the ship's power plant. Now, what is the purpose of the boiler, you might ask? Well, very simply, you take the fuel from the ship and you set fire to it, whether that fuel is coal or oil or whatever else you might be using in more recent times. And from that fire, you get heat, but that heat doesn't drive the ship directly. So you have to turn that heat into something else. And what it's turned into in the period for naval boilers is steam. The steam can then be sent to the engines to propel them, and thus as the engines move, so do the propeller shaft, thus the propeller moves, and thus the ship moves. Or I suppose in very, very early times, the paddle wheel, but never mind. But you can have all the fancy engines you like, but if the steam isn't arriving in enough quantities and at a high enough pressure, you're not going to go anywhere fast. And so the history of naval boilers could perhaps be shortly summarised as mankind's efforts to fit pressure bombs of increasingly worrying amounts of destructive power into the hearts of their ships in an effort to make them go faster. Because at the end of the day, if you get your boiler wrong, that is basically what you've created, a gigantic steam-powered pipe bomb. One other thing to clear up here at the start is what exactly steam is. In terms of naval boilers and thus marine engineering, what we're talking about is actually what we would call superheated steam. Now, you might think steam is something that you see coming out of the top of a kettle. No, this is not steam in the engineering sense. That is a mixture of true steam, which is a colourless gaseous form of water, and water vapour droplets in the air. And that visible part of what is commonly called steam is actually incredibly dangerous for ships' engines, because unlike a gas, water is incompressible. So if you have this visible type of quote-unquote steam, in the reciprocating piston of a reciprocating engine, then as the drive shaft comes down, it's going to encounter liquid water, which is incompressible, or near enough as makes no difference, which is going to cause all sorts of hideous damage to the engine. To give a more commonly understood example, think about driving your car through particularly high flood water, and if the pistons in your car's engine get flooded, that causes a lot of damage to your car, unless your car obviously shorts out, which it's more likely to do these days before the water gets in. Because, believe it or not, put under enough pressure, the metal of your car engine will give out before the water does. And the same thing in marine engines. And when you go from triple expansion or double expansion or basically reciprocating engines over to turbines, it's even worse news because... Well, there's a reason you can use the more commonly thought of version of steam in things like steam cleaners and uh, steam paint strippers to get rid of all sorts of wonderful things, including rust. And that's before you account for stuff that might be in that water, various minerals and such. And so if you blast a jet of what is in all due likelihood a mild acid over some very sensitive high-speed metalwork, it's going to eat into that turbine pretty quickly, and again, you're going to have failure of turbines. And that can be quite spectacular. So what we're looking at is the ability for boilers to generate what's called superheated steam, which, as I said, is that incredibly hot see-through gas that comes out of, let's say, a kettle if you look very closely at the very spout. And that's why sticking your hand into the column of, quote-unquote, steam rising out of your kettle spout at, say, two, three feet above, it makes you slightly warm and makes your hand slightly damp. Whereas whilst your kettle is boiling, if you stick your hand right over the spout and 
please don't do this. Um, that way lies flesh being stripped from bone and extreme pain and possibly death, if depending on how powerful your kettle is. And of course, how long you uh, stick your hand there for. And that's just with a kettle, let alone something like a naval boiler. So with all that said and done, let's get on to naval boilers themselves. Now, the boiler, to power a steam engine, had in fact gone through a number of technological developments before they arrived in the first warships to be steam-powered. The very earliest boilers were literally gigantic rectangular or cubic metal tanks full of water that you stuck a fire under. This is, of course, incredibly inefficient, as if you consider the area where the fire is, you've got the ground, you've got the upper surface, which is the underside of the boiler, and you've got four sides through which the heat can escape, plus obviously the ground will absorb some heat. So it's a very inefficient way of heating the boiler, and it only heats the underside of the boiler at any given time, which means only a limited amount of the water within the boiler is being heated. That heated water obviously then has to pass up through all the cold water, so it takes an awful long time to boil, uses an awful lot of fuel, and doesn't generate all that much steam. The size of the boilers needed, along with the size of the accompanying steam engines, and the relatively small amount of work that could be done as a result was basically of no use in ships, and so these kind of boilers were pretty much only experimental and occasionally seen in the very earliest uses of steam engines, such as some mine workings. The next stage was the development of the so-called fluid boiler, and this was where a flue, or effectively a pipe, was run from the firebox, which was now almost entirely enclosed, except for a hatch at the front where you'd shovel in more fuel, in most of the time this would be coal, and the hot gases from the combustion of the fuel would pass through a cylindrical pipe, or flue, of fairly large diameter, which itself ran through a body of water, which was in a tank. This was somewhat more efficient, and could be made more efficient still with the invention of the double flue boiler, where the flue doubled back on itself, so the length of the flue or pipe was slightly more than double what it could otherwise be in a single flue boiler. By enclosing the fire, and then passing the heat through the body of water rather than just on the underside, you increased the overall surface area that was contacted by the heat, which improved the efficiency of the boiler by a considerable margin. A further revision of this was the use of corrugated metal instead of plate metal when making the flue, which of course increased the surface area in contact with the water. But whilst this offered some increase in power, and was good for some early steam locomotives, it was still nowhere near efficient enough in terms of fuel usage or power generated to be of any particular use aboard a warship. However, as this technology advanced, the power output and fuel efficiency did reach a point where it could be useful in some commercial steamships, and so it was this kind of boiler that would see first service aboard ocean-going and river-going steam craft. The next interim step in development was where warships first started to use boilers, and this was the multi-flued boiler. Now the flues were still fairly large, and in most cases they were rectangular, but with multiple flues running through the same water tank, there was of course a much greater amount of surface area in contact with the water from the multiple flues, and the amount of water in the tank at any given time was less, which meant it was easier and faster to boil that water, and hence to create steam. However, their efficiency was still such that the boilers and the engines that accompanied them needed to be quite tall, and this was a concern for the Admiralty, because they recognised that, as we said before, they'd effectively invited steam-powered pressure bombs onto their ships, which were powered by fire. Neither of these things were particularly attractive on board wooden warships, which were, of course, the first recipients of the steam engine and its associated boilers, and they responded particularly badly to having holes poked in them by high-velocity metal projectiles, like, say, cannon fire. 
And so the Admiralty was rather keen that these boilers and the engines should be kept below the waterline where at all possible, because at that time cannonballs were incredibly likely to punch through the side of a ship below the waterline, and thus the boilers would be safe. Well, at least until the ship began to flood and water got in and there was a massive steam explosion, but at that point things were probably already quite bad anyway. And indeed, even if a cannonball that punched through a boiler didn't set off some kind of explosion or spread fire everywhere, it would at the very minimum set a bunch of very, very hot water vapour, i.e. steam, flooding through the ship's engine compartments and other parts of the ship, which tended to do nasty things to the ship's crew as well as cause the loss of all power. And of course, with your engineering crew all freshly parboiled, there would be nothing much they could do to stop the fr spread of fires from the boiler through the rest of the ship. And so the next advancement was very welcomed by the Admiralty, and this was the invention of the fire tube boiler. In this boiler, the larger rectangular flues were replaced by smaller cylindrical tubes. These could be more tightly packed together, thus ensuring a greater efficiency of heat transfer, because there were more of them and thus more surface area in contact with the water. And also, thanks to their lack of corners, far less susceptible to being degraded at points over time by the superheated gas that was being pumped through them. They were also significantly stronger thanks to their cylindrical shape, which meant you could run them at higher pressures. The more compact nature of this type of boiler meant that the height of the boiler could be reduced, and thus the Admiralty's fears could be somewhat allayed, and so this kind of box boiler was seen in quite a number of ironclads across many nations during the 1850s and 1860s. It was so called because, as you can see, the oval shape of the boiler was a simple box shape with the furnace underneath, sending its gases through the tubes and then up through the exhaust to the funnels. One particular feature of this kind of boiler was two sets of safety valves. One set was fairly obvious. In case the steam got to too high a pressure, these safety valves would pop open and release the steam before the boiler exploded. But there were another set of safety valves that opened inwards onto the boiler, and these were in place because with this kind of boiler, once the fires were quenched and the boiler went out of use, the steam that was left in the boiler, particularly in the tubes, would start to condense back into water, and taking up far less volume, this would create a vacuum. Over the surface area of the average naval boiler, this could create enough vacuum pressure for the atmosphere to actually crush the sides of the boiler in. And so these safety valves were designed to let air into the boiler should the pressure fall too low. But as ships got larger through the late 1850s and into the 1860s, and targeted speeds became higher, engines needed even more steam and at even higher pressures to drive themselves fast enough and with enough power to push these new ships through the water. This meant that the box boiler was no longer suitable, as the water contained in the box tank was now generating steam at a sufficiently high pressure that the box would fail before the necessary steam pressure was reached. And so boilers transitioned over to a cylindrical type, as the cylinder was much stronger. This had obviously already been found with the fire tubes themselves, but now the water tank which was generating the steam was also cylindrical. This allowed steam pressure to rise from about 25 pounds per square inch in the 1850s to about 45 pounds per square inch by the end of the 1860s. Additional improvements were made in the 1870s. This consisted of running the exhaust gases from the fires through the water in the boiler three times, once on the underside of the boiler to the so-called combustion chamber, Along this path it would do a degree of preheating to the water in the boiler. The combustion chamber was where the final combustion of the fuel would take place, as distinct from the firebox, and where the temperature would really get going. Then the combustion gases would pass through the various tubes as per a regular fire tube boiler. The water that had been preheated was thus closer to boiling point, and so less energy was needed to get it up to boiling, and thus into steam. The combustion gases would then pass through a final large flue at the top of the boiler, 
which would further preheat water that was held in saddle tanks on either side of the boiler, as well as providing a very hot surface at the top of the boiler, which of course is where the steam was exiting, and this would help to superheat the steam. Corrugation also made a reappearance now in the cylindrical fire tubes, which increased the strength of the fire tubes as well as improving the surface area in contact with the water yet again. With these refinements and advancements, boiler pressure had gone up yet again, with some boilers being used in the 1880s and early 1890s aboard small ships like torpedo boats, which needed to move very quickly, reaching between 120 and 180 pounds per square inch of pressure. However, this was approaching the limits of what could be done by simply setting fire to a bunch of burnable materials and directing that exhaust through various pipework. On land, this problem could be solved by allowing the steam to escape via the funnel, as if you're a locomotive, there'll be water towers along the route once you've run out of water because you've boiled it all away, and for a factory or similar, you can always make sure you're connected to a water supply. However, at sea, ironically enough, you're not in this position. That's not to say you're not surrounded by water, you most definitely are. However, seawater contains all sorts of wonderful minerals, and constantly taking in seawater would result in large amounts of encrustations and blockages forming within the boiler, which would rapidly lead to loss of efficiency, and then potentially also problems like, again, explosions. Fresh water is generally slightly less full of mineral contaminants than seawater, but is still not really suitable for long-term use in steam engines. However, on land, filtering and purifying water is a relatively easy thing to do, whereas at sea, setting up a water filtration and distillation plant aboard a warship uses precious space that you really, really don't have. Also, in the very earliest parts of steam boiler usage, having a filtration and distillation plant was also something that you didn't have, at any rate in a form that you could fit in a ship. And so a steamship would set out with a certain amount of boiler water, which was hopefully relatively clean. Now you might have to top that up with seawater, but ideally you wanted to keep as much pure water as possible. And this is where the surface condenser came in. The surface condenser was not strictly part of the boiler, but it needs mentioning to explain part the problem that they were facing. This takes the steam at the end of its cycle, after it's powered the engines, and condenses it from steam back into water, which can then be fed back into the ship's tanks, where it can be reboiled again and the energy transferred again, using the same, mostly pure water. Some water is obviously going to be lost, and over time boiler water could become contaminated with the necessary injections of seawater to top it up, but this extended the lifespan of boilers quite considerably, and it also meant that small distillation plants later on could be set up aboard ships to try and keep from having to use seawater at all, except in emergencies. Now, the reason this is directly relevant to the development of naval boilers was that without the steam exhausting out of the system, there was no additional pull that could be harnessed beyond natural convection of the exhaust gases to suck air into the furnaces. As, of course, if you do suck air into the furnaces, that means more oxygen is flowing across the fuel for any given amount of time, which increases the combustion rate, which increases the temperature, and more temperature means more steam, which means more pressure, which means you can go faster. The solution to this, introduced around 1880, was forced or induced draft. The two are of a similar concept, but different in execution. With induced draft, as the gases run up the funnel, there is a fan installed in the funnel to drive the gases out. As obviously the fan imparts additional energy to the gases, this creates a vacuum below the funnel, which sucks more air up from the area of the combustion chamber and the firebox, which in turn sucks air more greedily from the engine room. And thus, with the greater airflow, you get the greater combustion as described earlier. Whereas with forced draft, this is effectively done at the other end. In this, an area of the ship around the boiler, potentially all the way up to the entire boiler room, is made airtight and then fans again are used to pump air into this 
volume which results in a positive pressure. Since this volume is airtight, the only place that this positive pressure can go to equalize with the outside air pressure is through the firebox and through the boiler and up out through the funnel, which again increases airflow and thus increases your pressure. This then represented pretty much the epitome of the fire tube boiler design, with the so-called Scotch boiler being a relatively popular type that was used and refined throughout the last three decades of the 19th century. As well as having now approached a cap on the pressure that could be achieved with the fire tube boiler, there were a number of other ongoing problems with this kind of design. Because there was a relatively large amount of water relative to the volume of the fire tubes, it took quite a while to raise steam pressure, which meant that ships could take quite some time to get up to any kind of useful speed. For this same reason, the large volume of water in the boiler, it was very difficult to respond quickly to a need to change the overall pressure. So in, say, a battle where you might want to be speeding up and slowing down, well, you might eventually work your way up to your top speed, but to slow down, you couldn't just damp the fires slightly. You'd have to blow off a large amount of steam pressure, at which point you would go slower, but it would take you a lot longer to build back up again, which could render you tactically vulnerable. Thus, as the century turned from the 19th to the 20th, the next step up in boiler technology began to be deployed across warships. This was the water tube boiler. As with most other kinds of boiler, it had been in use on land for considerable amounts of time in various guises before it made its way onto warships, as generally the needs of warships were very specific. So outside of a few circumstances, they generally adopted boiler technology somewhat later than their land-based counterparts. In a water tube boiler, the vast bulk of the boiler is now occupied with the hot combustion gases from the furnace and the tubes are now actually running water through this incredibly hot environment and turning the water then into steam. As the individual tubes are considerably smaller than the overall volume of the boiler as, as a whole, they can be operated at significantly higher pressures. However, whilst the tubes in a fire tube boiler are vulnerable to build up of things like soot from the exhaust gases, the tubes in a water tube boiler are much more vulnerable to the build up of mineral deposits and calcification, amongst other things, from the water being flash boiled into steam. And while most fire tube boilers could be cleaned relatively easily by opening a hatch at the front while, when the fires were down, and effectively doing a horizontal chimney sweep, getting in to a water tube boiler system is much more complicated and getting rid of calcification and other mineral buildup as a result of water operating through is a considerably harder job as anybody who's had to clean a pipe in a hard water area or lost a kettle to limescale will understand. As there's a much smaller volume of water being heated for a given boiler, it means that steam is produced a lot quicker and the boiler can respond a lot faster to changes in demand, which means that ships can get up to steam faster and they can also slow down and speed up faster as it's much easier to control the relative temperature of the water tubes. And whilst running a water tube boiler on impure water can make life very difficult, it does allow you to run the boiler with impure fuels much, much more easily, as with a large combustion volume, the deposits of ash and such like tend to build up in areas that are much more easy to clean, have less effect on the, take a lot longer to affect the water tubes themselves, and as a result of the greater volume, also take a lot longer to affect anything much of the boiler's operation. They are, however, considerably more expensive. Nonetheless, water tube boilers were definitely the way forward, and initially they operated, as you can see here, with a water drum at the base of the boiler, which would then feed water up through the tubes up into a working steam chamber with a superheater attachment to one side. This was all well and good, except that with the introduction of turbine engines, the need for ever more steam and ever higher pressures was growing more and more, 
and so the development of the three-drum boiler proceeded apace. This took various forms in various navies, with various makers having their own particular takes on it, but as you can see in this diagram, they all followed generally the same layout, and this had two feed water drums, one on either side at the base, and these would run pipes up towards a single chamber at the top. This, of course, increased the amount of steam that could be generated in a given boiler without increasing the footprint all that much. The overall efficiency of this layout is not perhaps as great as some other designs, but other designs of water tube boiler that are more efficient take up significantly more space, and as we said, space is at a premium aboard a ship. It was in part the development of these boilers that allowed ships' speeds to jump considerably. Using battleships as an example, with the old fire tube boilers, ships could generally be expected to hit 14 to 16 knots. With the new water tube boilers, the average speed of a capital ship went up to about 18 knots, and once you introduced turbines into the equation to take a more advantage of the superheated steam that was being generated, the average battleship speed went up still further to 21 knots, with some of them able to reach slightly higher speeds up to 23 knots. Naval boiler technology then plateaued somewhat for a while during the 1900s, 1910s, and in some cases going into the 1920s, as refinements to this kind of boiler layout were sort of tinkering with an established design, and the main change in terms of generated power came from the introduction of oil fuel instead of coal. This is because a given amount of oil can generate more energy than a given amount of coal, as it is a more volatile substance, and this burn rate can be increased not only through the use of forced or induced draft, but also by spraying it, which creates an aerosolized mist of fuel, which obviously has a much greater surface area in contact with the air, which accelerates the speed of the combustion. And so, using these advances, it was possible to start pushing capital ships up to 25 knots, or even more if you're prepared to throw in a lot of extra boilers and engines, which allows for things such as the Queen Elizabeth class and the various battle cruisers of the First World War. However, as indicated previously, the tubes in a water tube boiler at this point were slightly larger than they strictly could be, partly as a result of feed water issues, and partly as a result of technological issues. It was possible to increase the pressure, and thus the power, of the boilers by using smaller tubes, but this ran at several risks. Obviously, poor feed water could block up a small tube much faster than it could block up a larger tube. The tubes themselves would be more vulnerable to damage from the heat, as there would be substantially less water in them, which meant that the tubes themselves would get much, much hotter. This was, of course, brilliant for generating steam, uh, but as most of you will know, once you start heating up metal to a significantly high temperature, it starts to exhibit rather unwelcome properties such as ductility. And the last thing you want is a ductile pipe that's full of high-pressure steam. Nonetheless, change was coming, and over the late 1910s and 1920s and into the 1930s, the so-called small tube boilers began to be used more and more. One of the biggest attractions of the small tube boiler to navies of the time was that it allowed for considerably more power to be generated whilst using significantly smaller amounts of the ship's overall volume. And with fewer boilers, there was less weight used, which meant the weight could be diverted to other purposes on ships that were being refitted, which during the 1920s and 1930s, with a lot of legacy World War I era shipping around, was a very, very important feature. This could allow for a number of things. You could maintain the same amount of power using significantly fewer boilers, and thus keep the same speed, but divert that extra weight saved into other things, making your ship more heavily armed, more heavily armoured, etc., as with HMS Warspite. So, for example, when she was launched, she used 24 boilers to generate 75,000 shaft horsepower, whereas after her refit, she generated almost as much shaft horsepower on a total of six boilers. This allowed for all sorts of new equipment to be installed, 
and significant amounts of additional armour to be installed on her decks. Almost at the other end of things were the Congo class, which as launched used 36 boilers to generate 64,000 shaft horsepower for a top speed of between 27 and 28 knots. During their refits, they had slightly more boilers installed, a total of 11 boilers, but these generated a staggering 136,000 shaft horsepower. Just under a third as many boilers, but generating twice as much power. As there were still fewer boilers being used, this allowed speed to increase substantially up to almost 31 knots, whilst also allowing for improved deck armour, as well as various other improvements to the upper works of the ship. Likewise, the Italians managed to take the Conte de Cavoir class, including the Giulio Cesare, up from 21.5 knots, using 24 boilers at 31,000 shaft horsepower, to 27 knots, using only 8 boilers, generating 75,000 shaft horsepower, albeit they did have to ditch a main gun turret in order to do so. Although it was never done, for obvious reasons, the refit planned for HMS Hood would likewise have replaced her 24 older style boilers, generating 144,000 shaft horsepower, with much more modern units, which would take up significantly less space while still generating slightly more shaft horsepower, which would keep her at her design speed of around 32 knots, whilst allowing for significant improvements in her protection, as well as obviously radar and new fire control systems. As we've discussed in a dry dock comparing the Megami's power plant and the Hoods, which were of comparable power output despite Megami's being significantly smaller, thus illustrating the advantages of more modern boilers, a straight for one for one replacement of old boilers with new would have resulted in ships that would go ridiculously quick, indeed probably far too fast for their hull designs. And it was this proliferation of small tube boilers that was the main change between World War I and World War II. We're almost at the end of this very abbreviated history of naval boilers, as gas turbines, diesel engines, and nuclear power would predominate quite significantly after the Second World War and into the modern era. However, there was one last advance to be made in the field of naval boiler technology. You now had the small tube boiler, but it was possible in theory to get them up to even higher pressures. The problem with this was that you needed to have a very fine control over the boilers themselves, as well as have them built to extremely fine manufacturing tolerances, as if you didn't, you'd end up with broken boilers and a broken ship. There were two navies who really took the lead in this field of high-pressure small water tube boilers, and that was the German Kriegsmarine and the US Navy. The advantage, of course, was that compared to even normal small water tube boilers, you could get a significantly higher power output, which in turn led to even smaller machinery spaces or higher speed for the same machinery space. In this endeavour, the US Navy had somewhat more success long term than the Germans, although the Kriegsmarine initially took the lead in deploying high pressure machinery, it tended to be a very high maintenance and very fiddly to keep running. Without a very experienced and well-trained crew who knew exactly what all the foibles of that particular power plant were, a ship could break down in rather spectacular manner rather quickly, as indeed the Prince Eugen did once it was taken into US Navy service temporarily at the end of the Second World War. Whilst initial American attempts met with substantially less success than the early German attempts, they took this as a motivation to actually get it right, and so by the time of the Second World War entering full swing, many American ships possessed very efficient, very reliable high-pressure small water tube boilers, which allowed them to operate, as we said, with significantly more power output for a given square footage of machinery space partially through their own developments and partially through, in some cases, adopting American technology, other navies would catch up sooner or later. But with other navies generally operating at 400 to 500 pounds per square inch, the fact that the US Navy's power plants could reliably operate at 600 pounds per square inch 
afforded them a number of advantages which would only be realised across the rest of the globe's navies in the late 1940s. And so that brings us to the end of this very abbreviated, approximately half-hour look at the history of naval boilers. There is, of course, as with the development of naval armour, a fantastically greater amount of detail to this subject, but I thought that this is probably the most compact I could make it, covering the main highlights of the development of naval boiler tech without getting into extreme fine detail in terms of marine engineering. But if you'd like to learn about this in significantly more detail, then I can suggest two books. One is A Short History of Naval and Marine Engineering by Edgar C. Smith. This was published in 1938, so it doesn't cover the last advances in high-pressure machinery that occurred in the run-up to and during World War II, uh, but it does give a fairly substantial background into the history and development of naval boiler technology up to that point. And the other one is the somewhat imaginatively titled Naval Boilers by Robert F. Latham, who published that for the United States Naval Academy Department of Marine Engineering in 1956, and so that does cover that final period. Um, both of these are available on, mo on most good online bookstores, and uh, hopefully that will give you a little bit more insight into the material that I had to cut down for this video. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.